Hey y'all! In this video, I'm going to demonstrate the use of the fluting toolpath. Fluting toolpath is used to create these decorative grooves in, for instance, a piece of applied molding like this one right here. This would be appropriate to use maybe as a plinth block or to use as the styles for a bookcase, for example. The use of the fluting toolpath is actually fairly simple. It just requires some open vectors for the bit to follow. Now, in this demonstration, I'm going to be using Aspire version 10.019. However, this works exactly the same way in vCarve Desktop and vCarve Pro. So the first step I'm going to take in creating these moldings is I'm going to create a rectangle out here that's going to define the perimeter of my molding. So what I'll do is I'm just going to create a rectangle somewhere over in here. And I want to make this rectangle 4 inches wide. And I want to make it 22 inches tall. So we'll go ahead and make sure I've got square corners selected, and I'll apply that. I want to make another rectangle just to help me to align this. I want to put this in the center of this half of my piece of material. So just as a little tip for alignment's sake, I'm going to draw another rectangle. I'm going to start it at this corner, and I'm going to bring it all the way down over here along my x-axis zero line right at the bottom of the material and that's going to be this rectangle here. Now this rectangle is just going to be used for alignment purposes. Now I'm going to click off to deselect everything. I'm going to select this rectangle first, hold down shift, then select that rectangle I just created last. Then I'll come over here under Transform Objects to Align Selected Objects. And I want to align this rectangle to the last item in the selection, which was this rectangle. I want to align it in the center, vertically, as well as horizontally. So I'll just click that icon, and that has centered this rectangle vertically and it's placed it in the center of this half of my piece of material. Now I can close that, click off to deselect again, then I'm going to select that last rectangle I created, and I'm going to go ahead and tap the delete key on my keyboard and get rid of it because I no longer need it. What I want to do with this four inch wide molding is I want to leave an uncut square up here at the top that's four inches by four inches. So I want to create some guidelines to help me to create a pocket down here to machine out an area. So I need a horizontal guideline four inches down from the top of this rectangle. To get that guideline, I'll just come up here into my scale click and hold and drag a guideline right down to that corner of my rectangle right here. This guideline is up at the top corner. I need it four inches down from where it's located. So you'll notice that when I put my cursor over the guideline, I get the up and down arrows. That's letting me know that I'm over a guideline. If I right click that guideline, it brings up the properties. And one of those properties is its current position. It's at plus 11 in Y. I need to move it down 4 inches. So I can do the math in my head, or I can use the built in calculator and say minus 4 then tap the equals key on my keyboard and that gives me a new position 
of 7 inches positive in Y, so 7 inches above my Y0. Now when I click Apply, that guideline moves down there. So now I know this is my 4 inch square I want to leave uncut. So I can close this and zoom out. Now from the bottom, I want to create another guide a quarter inch up because I want to leave this area down here, the bottom quarter inch, uncut. So I'll move my material up a little bit. Again, I'll come up here into this scale up at the top, drag another guideline down, and I want to reference off the corner. If I bring it down here, it may or may not reference off of the bottom of that rectangle. This time it is. It doesn't always do that. It will snap to a corner. So I've snapped my guide to the corner right here. But now I want to move it a quarter inch up. So again, I'll right click. My current position is at negative 11. I want it a quarter inch above that. That would be 10.75. So the new position. I can come down here and change this to negative 10.75. Click Apply. And now my guideline is a quarter inch above the bottom of my rectangle. So now I can close that. What I needed these guidelines for was so I can create another rectangle out here to pocket out the center of this material about a quarter of an inch. So I'm going to start with a draw rectangle, make sure I have square corners, and I'm going to start right here at this intersection, right where this guideline is. I'll click and drag that rectangle down to this guideline and release. If we look, because it was zoomed so far out, that rectangle was created all the way to the bottom corner. So that happens. I'll close my Create Rectangle, and I'm going to click on that rectangle once again to go into Move and Transform mode. Now I'll just grab this center square, drag it up onto my guideline, and now. I have a rectangle that goes from this guideline, four inches down from the top, to this guideline, a quarter inch up from the bottom. To create this pocket here, I need my rectangle to be just a little bit wider than my piece of material. Because I'm going to be using a fairly large bit to hollow this out, this rectangle needs to be quite a bit wider on each side. It needs to overhang. And the reason for that is if I leave it like this right now, I'm going to end up with an uncut corner right here where the tool's radius will be. So I want that bit to come outside of this area here enough to move that radius out this direction. You'll see what I mean when we actually go to calculate this toolpath. So what I'm going to do is, with that rectangle selected, I'll come over here to Set Selected Object Size. Now currently, it's 4 inches wide. I'm going to be using a 3 quarter inch diameter bit. so. I want at least a half inch wider. I want that bit to come out at least a quarter of an inch beyond this edge. And the same thing out here. So I'm going to make sure I have link X and Y unchecked and make this 4.5. Make sure I have it anchored at the center. I'll click Apply close, and now my rectangle is a quarter of an inch wider this way, 
and a quarter of an inch wider this way. Then my profile rectangle here. Now I'm going to click off to deselect and zoom back in here, center up my material. I want my flutes to start an inch below this square. So I want them to start down here somewhere. And I want them to start an inch above this bottom edge of the pocket. So I'm going to go ahead and move my guidelines an inch up this way and an inch down this way. And this will help me to place my flutes. So again, we'll right click on that guide and I'm going to move my position down one inch. So we'll change that to six inches up from zero in Y. We'll click apply and my guideline is moved down an inch. Close that. And I'll come grab this one. Now this guideline is already a quarter inch up from the bottom here, but I wanted another inch up. So I can change the negative 10 to negative 9, click apply, and it's moved up an inch from the bottom of this pocket. Now I can close that. Now that tells me the length of my flutes. Now I need to get my horizontal placement of my flutes. And I'm going to base that off of this edge of my molding here. I want my first flute to be a half inch in. I want the center of that flute to be a half inch away from this edge. So once again, I'll zoom out. I'm going to come up here to the top just so I can reference off of this corner. And I'm going to drag a vertical guide from here to that corner. Now I want to move this guide in one half inch. So this is going to be a positive move. I want it to move a half inch closer to zero. So I'll right click. And we can see it's at 4.8125. I want it to go a further half inch. So I'll click to the far right of the last digit in my new position box here. And on my keyboard, I'll type plus point five, then tap equals, and I get my new position measurement. Click apply, and that guide is moved over one half inch. I close my guide properties, center up my material, and now I know I want to draw my first flute. I want my first flute to run from this intersection right here to this intersection right here. Now it's a simple case of coming over here under Create Vectors to draw a line or polyline. Click on that icon. Come right over here to this intersection. Click. Drag down to this intersection. Click. Move off. Space bar to accept that line. Close. OK. Let's do a little bit of cleanup because it looks like we have a mess out here going with all of these guides. They're getting in the way. To hide these guides, I can come up here to this corner where the two scales meet. And this right here, this square, is actually a button. Right now you can see it's got a vertical and a horizontal guideline. If I click that, the guidelines go away, they disappear, and now that button is grayed out to show me that those guidelines are hidden. I've not deleted them, I've just turned them off so I don't see them. If I need them back, I can just click that button again and my guides are back. I'll click on them again to hide them because right now they're in the way. Okay, so here is my first flute. And I've decided that what I want is I want four flutes evenly spaced with the first flute being a half inch away from this edge and the last flute being a half inch away from this edge. So 
the easiest way to do this is to create a linear array of these fluting lines. Now, I'm going to be creating four lines. That means I'm going to have three spaces in between them. Now, see if you can follow me here. Our material is four inches wide. I want the flutes to be a half inch in on this side and a half inch in on this side. So if we take this four inches minus a half inch minus another half inch, that gives us three inches. So I want four lines evenly spaced with three spaces in between them. That means these lines are going to be one inch apart. I'll have my profile. Half inch in is my first line. An inch over is my second. An inch over is my third. An inch over is my fourth, which will leave a half inch between the fourth line and this edge. Remember, take the number of lines you want. Count the spaces in between. Then do your math from there. Three spaces divided into three inches is one. So I want a one inch gap between these lines. This is important right now. I'll select that line, come down to offset and layout, and I want to do an array copy, a linear array. So I'll click on that. Now, with this line selected, it's telling me that the object size in X is zero, but in Y, it's 15 and three quarters of an inch long. How many rows of this line do I want in Y? Well, I only want one row. I don't want any more rows up above or down below. So I only want one row in Y. But I do want four columns wide in X. I want four lines. I want to space them with a gap of one inch apart in X. I'm going to group the copies after they're created. So all of these lines will be in a group. And I'll click Copy. Then Close. And I now have a group of four evenly spaced lines for my ball nose bit to follow to cut these flutes. Those are the vectors needed to carve our piece of molding. Now I want to make two of them. So with one created, I have these vectors grouped, I have my pocket, and I have my outside profile. I can now select them all, come over here under Transform Objects to Mirror Selected Objects. I'll click on that, and I want to mirror all of these vectors. I want to flip about the job center, and I want to create a mirrored copy. I'll click Flip Horizontal, Close, and I now have two identical sets of vectors centered on my X and Y zero. Now I'm ready to start calculating some tool paths. So we'll go over here to the tool path tab and the first thing I want to do is I want to cut this pocket. So I'll select this rectangle, hold down shift, select this rectangle. And now you'll see what I'm talking about, about making this rectangle just slightly wider than the pocket I want to cut. We'll come over here to a pocket tool path. My start depth is going to be zero because I want to start at the surface of the material. And yes, I do want to cut a quarter of an inch deep. For the end mill, I am going to use my three quarter inch end mill. Select that. And I'm going to do this in two passes. I just want it to be a little bit more gentle 
with this particular material. I don't want it to plunge in and cut away a quarter of an inch. We'll do it in two passes. I'm using a very large bit, so I'm not going to use a large area clearance tool. I want to cut in a raster pattern to clear this pocket. I want it to go back and forth. And I'm using a raster angle of 90 degrees, meaning instead of going back and forth horizontally, it's going to go back and forth vertically. My profile pass, after it clears out the material, I have it set to cut that last. Now, the bit that I am using, it's a three-quarter inch bit, but it does not have a cutter all the way across the bottom. So I have to make sure I ramp in my plunge moves. So I have that checked, and I want it to plunge and ramp over a distance of double the bit's diameter. So that's an inch and a half. I'll go ahead and I will call this the pocket and we'll calculate. I'll go ahead and preview that tool path. And there is our pocket. We can see that it is cleared out an area a quarter of an inch deep. Looking down here at my readout, we see that it is carved a quarter of an inch deep, so all is well there. Now I can close my preview, come back here into my 2D view, click off, and now I want to select my flutes. Hold down Shift, select these flutes, and we'll come up here to the fluting toolpath. Since I've already carved a pocket a quarter of an inch deep, I need these flutes to start at that quarter inch depth. So I'm going to come up here and I'm going to set a start depth of 0.25 inches. And I want these flutes to cut, let's go with 0.15 deep. Flutes like this are normally carved with a ball nose. However, they don't have to be. You can carve a V-shaped flute with a V-bit. You can use a point cutting roundover bit. I'm going to use a ball nose bit. So I've already got the quarter inch ball nose selected. That is the bit I'm going to use. So I don't have to worry about that. Now down here we have three different flute types. We can ramp the flute over the complete length, meaning I can start at my start depth and the bit will start cutting right at the surface and over the length of this entire flute it will end up carving 0.15 deep. So it'll gradually get deeper and cut deeper into the material until we're down to our cut depth, the 0.15 down here. That's one way of doing it. This would come in handy if you were, say, cutting uh, a draining board into a countertop, a solid wood or solid surface countertop, or you wanted to create juice grooves in a cutting board that had a little well off to one side. You could create those ramped grooves to channel the juices down into that little pocketed well. You can also have a ramp at start. And you enter your ramp length down here. What that means is, for instance, in this case, we have a start depth of quarter inch. This means that it would ramp down from that quarter inch down to the 0.15 cutting depth here at the start and then stay at that 1.5 cutting depth the rest of the way down that flute. Now we've got a ramp length set here of one inch. So this plunge from the start depth down to the flute depth would take place over the course of one inch right here. So it would start at the surface and ramp down to 0.15 deep over the distance of one inch and the rest of this flute would be that 0.15 deep. 
Then we have the third type which I'm going to use, and that is ramp at start and end. So it's going to start up here at my start depth. It's going to, over the course of one inch, it's going to plunge in till it's 0.15 deep and run that entire length at 0.15. Then an inch away from the end, it's going to retract back out to my start depth. Now we've got two different types of ramps down here. You have a linear ramp or you have a smooth ramp. A linear ramp means it will start at the beginning here of my vector and just lower itself straight down over the course of that one inch. It will be a straight ramp. A smooth ramp, as you see by the example here, will be a curved smoother ramp rather than an angular ramp. Now I've selected the smooth here. So we'll go ahead and just call this the fluting toolpath. And I'll calculate. Now let me kind of set it off a little bit here off to the side so we can see it. And we'll preview this toolpath. And there we have our flutes. As you can see, it starts right here at a quarter of an inch deep, slowly plunges its way down until it's 0.15 deep. Then it continues on down at that depth until we get an inch away from the bottom, then comes right back up until we're back to our quarter of an inch start depth. Now, the only thing that remains is to cut our profile. And that is these two vectors right here. We'll close our preview window. We'll create a profile tool path. My start depth will be zero. I want it to cut all the way through my material. So I'll go Z plus 0 0.005 equals. That took the thickness of my material that I set up over in job setup over here and added five thousandths of an inch, so I know it's going to cut all the way through the material. I'm going to use a quarter inch end mill. I'm going to machine to the outside of the vectors. For this demonstration, I'm not going to do a separate last pass or add tabs to the tool path. However, I am going to ramp in my plunge moves. I'll use a smooth ramp over a distance of two inches. And I want to check to make sure I have sharp external corners checked. And we'll call this profile cutout. We'll calculate this tool path. It's giving me the warning that it's going to cut all the way through the material. And we'll preview that tool path. Okay, and now we see that even though I made that pocket just a little bit wider than my material, it wasn't enough because I still have some of my radius from that three quarter inch bit. Looks to be about an eighth of an inch of material here still has the radius from that bit. So, what do you do in that situation? Well, you reset your preview, close the preview, go back over to the drawing tab, and we'll take this rectangle, go into set object size, and let's just go ahead Make sure we have link x, y unchecked and that we're anchored in the center. Let's change that to 5. 5.0. Apply. Then without closing our set size window, select this one. Do the same thing. 5.0. Apply. Close. Now. Go back over 
and the only toolpath we need to recalculate is the pocket. We'll double click that, make sure both of our vectors are selected. We don't need to change anything. We'll calculate that pocket. And now we'll uncheck that. We'll preview all the toolpaths at one time. And there we go. Now I can rock this back a little bit. I'll double click on my waste material to get rid of it. And now we have our two pieces of molding that we can save G code for and go outside and cut. Now, as I said, this fluting toolpath can be used with various bits for all kinds of decorative purposes. As long as the bit is capable of cutting as it plunges into the material, meaning it has a cutter along the bottom edge, be that a V-bit, a ball nose, a center point plunge, round over bit, whichever. Get in an experiment, play with it, have a little bit of fun. So, I hope you got something out of this video. If you did, I would appreciate a thumbs up. And remember, today at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, I'll be hosting a live Q&A session where we'll talk about the fluting tool path, guidelines, or anything else that I've covered in this video. Again, that's noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern Time, right here on my YouTube channel. And I'll put a link to that live Q&A session down in the description box below. These live Q&A sessions are a great reason to go ahead and subscribe to my channel if you're not subscribed already. And if you subscribe, I do hope you'll click that little bell button right next to that subscribe button. That way, you'll get a notification every time I post a video and every time I go live. So, I hope to see you this afternoon. And as always, whether you subscribe to my channel or not, I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time to watch, and y'all take care.